over the weekend, I uh, taped an interview with K. Howe Jackson of Adelaide, Austra South Australia. She's a comedian on cruise ships down there, amongst other things. And then I was going to use that on my uh, show uh, this morning. However, I had Wi-Fi issues. I had technical issues uh, during the show, during the playing back of the interview. So I decided to just put it up as a standalone uh, video. And so with no further ado, I will bring you my chilly chats with K. Hal Jackson. My guest this morning on Chilly Chats is a stand-up comic entertainer for P&O Cruises Australia. She's originally from Honolulu, lives in near Adelaide in South Australia. With no further ado, let me introduce the comic extraordinaire, Key Howe Jackson. Key Howe, welcome to Chilly Chats. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's uh, I, it's chilly here, too. As a matter of fact, it's winter here, so it's very cold outside. Well, now, I did have a message about you today, and, so, and which leads to my first question of, of this uh, uh, interview, whatever you want to call it. It seems that Lucy the dog... You oh. took Lucy the dog for a walk so uh, uh, she could chase uh, kangaroos, and you got cold and cut the walk short, and Lucy the jo dog is complaining. Is there any truth to that? <laughs> yes, she always, she's, <laughs> she's a Kelpie, and Kelpies are uh, cattle dogs. They're herding dogs, and they're very, um, oh, what should I say? They're very active, and so they need a lot of exercise. So generally, I walk her about five kilometers in the morning. Um, during the winter, my husband does it because I can't. 22 years in uh, almost in this country, and I'm still freezing every winter. So during the winter, he takes her. During the summer, I'm solar powered. I'm up at 6 o'clock, and we're out the door. But every other time, she's at the foot of the bed, like, you know, hurry up, fat girl, put on your shoes, let's move it, six o'clock already, you know, and I'm like, oh, talk to your dad. So um, he had gone to a football game, so I had to take her out, and it was so cold, and I just normally, it's like, cut it short, and she's like, that's it, that's all, that's it, that's all, you know, she just gets like, oh, I guess we're going to go home now, you know, but she's, yeah, she just loves how, the exercise. How cold is it in South Australia? Uh. Let's see. It was. They have a thing here where they don't, they don't say the wind chill factor. They say, "Oh, it's five degrees, but it feels like minus one." Like, well, then it is minus one if it feels like minus one. Yeah. But it's been really cold, like on some mornings. So that's all centigrade. So you're looking at yeah. maybe in the twenties so or the teens. Yeah, that would be down. Yeah, 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 yeah it's cold. That. I, yeah. See, yeah, I'm like cold. you. Yeah. And it's as cold. I've gotten older, and I tell you, as you get older. Yeah. It gets yeah, worse. Yeah, I, I, you start I, wearing socks. I'm doing. I'm doing. My my son goes, "Mom, you just like grandma. You're wearing socks all the time." I'm like, "Yeah, I'm freezing." You know. Yeah. I know. How did you ever become a stand-up comic on a cruise ship? Well, you know, I started in comedy quite late. Um, most comics start in their twenties, sometimes in their teens. You know, but I, you know, I always love stand-up comedy. Um, from the time I was little, I just loved, you know, when you're in Honolulu in the 1950s, you really don't have a lot. There wasn't a lot of comedy, stand-up comedy anyway. And I got all of my comedy fix from the Ed Sullivan show because we would watch it religiously every Sunday, like many families in the U.S. We, we saw it every Sunday. And it was the best variety show when you always had comedians on. But these were all comics from like the borscht belt and you know these are all the old jewish take my wife please you know you know all of that so i grew up watching alan king and henny youngman and you know Toady fields and there weren't a lot of women um uh you know uh what's her name was quite young then um so this was my introduction to comedy but i loved comedy i love you know i loved all the old comics the old comedy movies you know abbott and costello all of that marx brothers are just my favorites 
So I grew up with that, but I didn't have an outlet for it in terms of stand-up comedy. And as I was growing up, my dad was a musician and an entertainer. And so I was around a lot of parties, a lot of musicians, a lot of rehearsals. Um, and so unknowingly, I learned a lot of timing because of that, which timing is something that you can teach people comedy, but timing is very difficult to learn if you don't already have it. So I unknowingly was schooled in a lot of what I needed later on when I became a comic. So, uh, you know, and then, you know, you don't think of it as a career move, you know, I went to a Catholic school, you know, they don't, they don't find humor that funny. Um, and so uh, I, you know, it's just funny around my friends and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And my dad was hilarious. So he would buy me comedy albums and we would sit in the old days, you had to buy an album. You didn't have, you know, HBO to, to listen to Robin Williams or whatever. So he would buy comedy albums. We would laugh together and whatever. So I had some of that. But then, you know, I got married. I had a job at the school, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then when I got divorced, um, I was raising a child by myself and I was living with my dad. He, he was very ill and helping to take care of him. And one night, um, my dad, my dad had Alzheimer's, right? And that's a 24 hour thing. You're, you're constantly working. One uh, week, my dad had gone to visit my sister in Minneapolis. Um, I think my grand, my uh, nephew was graduating or something. So we, I sent him off and I was home and I, my son and I, we had nothing to do. And I opened the newspaper for change. We had a break, right? I opened the newspaper. It was my, my 43rd birthday. I opened the newspaper, there was an ad for an open mic night. And I thought, you know, I don't want to be in my rocking chair when I'm 80 thinking, you know, what if I just tried it? The most they can tell me is you're not funny, go home, you know? So I thought, well, I'm going to get it out of my system. So I didn't have my dad to take care of. So I trundled down to the open mic. I put together some stories that I told my friends over the years. Um, and I did really well, and I was hooked. I, I was just like, oh my God, I, I just, this is where I should be. When I was on stage, I thought, I love this. This is what I should be doing. And so after that, I just got together with other local comics, and we started working all over. There was one comedy club, um, and I was asked to to work there. And I, you know, I was, the guy that was running the open mic, let me back up a sec, he was looking for new talent because he was a comic that had made it in of the mainland US was coming home to raise his kids. And he was doing a show and he said, you wanna be in my show? And I said, no. And he goes, why, what the, what's wrong? I said, because I don't, this is what you saw is everything I have. I don't know anything yet, you know what I mean? And I thought, if I'm gonna be in a professional show, I want people to say, well, that was worth the price of the ticket, not like, who the hell is that? So I said, no, let me learn my chops first. Let me get out there and do the hard yards. And so we did, I mean, we, <laughs> My friends and I, we would perform at like we go to a bar and we go, okay, Tuesday's your bad night. You're nobody there. Let us do a show. We won't charge you. We just need the stage time. And so that's what we did. So we had people doing their taxes in front of us. I mean, nobody cared. You know what I mean? But we learned how to do our craft. And so year, years gone by, I started working in local the local club. I started learning from other comics. And then when I moved to Australia, because my second husband is Australian, I moved to Australia. And there was a much a bigger comedy scene here. All the cities had comedy clubs. There was a lot more going on. Um, there weren't that very many women it's still, you know. And so I got into the local club here in Adelaide, South Australia, and I began working. And I met a lot of comics, and some of them were working on cruise ships. And one in particular, my friend Bev Killick, uh, excellent comic, uh, national headliner, she saw me and she said, look, you, you know, you, here's my agent's name. Here, you got to get out. You got to start touring, which I did. And then eventually, because she was working on a cruise ship, she recommended me. And long story short, they decided to hire me. Now, the thing about it was that, as you know, you've been on a lot of cruises. The, the ages of cruise people generally, you're looking at people, probably the bulk of them between 40 and 60 years old. That's like a lot of the cruise ship. Time. And there's people older than that. And there's people younger than that. A lot more younger people are going on cruises now. They've become a bit more affordable. There's more of a range of product. Um, they're short cruises. The comedy cruises that I do, um, as well as other cruises, are short. They're like three nights. So they're affordable for people, younger people, um, and all of that. But when I got on, they were like, oh, perfect. A woman, a woman older, 
Um, a, a lot of women are on cruises, a lot of older women on cruises. It was nobody speaking to that audience. And so when I got on there and I talked about my kids, my husband, my, my life, um, you know, my body's falling apart, you know, all the stories that we talk to each other about, they, it, hit a, it hit a nerve. And so I became quite popular on the cruise ships because I was, some people, I was someone that people could look at and go, oh, my God, that's me. That's my life. I've done that. Oh my God, my kids are nuts too. Oh my gosh, you know, my, and all of that kind of stuff. And so because people had a chance to identify with me, it became a regular thing. And so I've been working on the cruises since 2015. Of course, we had to take a slight break for the last Just two years. Just a little, little vacation <laughs> in there. Just a little speed bump on the road. But um, yeah, and so I finally got into that. So I've been doing comedy now since 1993. Um, so what is that like 28 some odd years for me? Um, so yeah, so that's how I got into the cruise thing and I love cruises and I would never have gone on a cruise to be honest. I would never have gone on a cruise before that. It didn't appeal to me and I didn't understand when I got on the cruises, I go, well, I get it. I get why people love cruising so much and people are like, you know, going every month or, you know, it, three, you know, people are going, oh, this is my 15th cruise. I'm like, you're nuts, you know, but once I was on it, I got it. You know, it's like, it's the best. You can go to all these different places. You don't have to pack, unpack, go to the airport, go to the next hotel, take time. And get, none of that. The, the hotel is moving. You know, you just get off, go to wherever, spend the day, have a great time, come back, ship, go somewhere else. You get out, you know, it was just the best. The foods are, you know, you got everything, all kinds of entertainment, the food, you know, and I thought, well, this is, you know, now I get it. I, I totally get why people love this, you know, so much entertainment, so much choice. You know, it's just, it's just a wonderful vacation. And the price is right for a lot of people, depending on your price, you can find the product pandemic hits yeah that shut us all down you guys when i say you guys australia worse than we had it here you know you were much later to get restarted than we yeah. were yeah how was it sitting in australia thinking those damn americans and europeans <laughs> are sailing and i'm not yeah yeah, Wasn't we were very, bad? well, you know, we were very disappointed, um, to say the least, you know. Um, but and especially because because of the pandemic, the land gigs dried up as well. I mean, there was no place for us to go. I mean, the, the cruises weren't working, but also a lot of the clubs were closed or they were limited in what they could do. And then depending on where you were, like Melbourne, they spent almost a year in lockdown. Uh, it was really bad in Melbourne. And Melbourne is like a, a real hub for, for comedy. So a lot of the clubs there weren't working. Comedians were, I mean, we just were having a, having a difficult time. So as things started loosening up, you, get, you had more land gigs and all that, but still not as many to accommodate everybody. So we were really disappointed that the cruises were taking so long. I mean, the cruise companies were, were petitioning the government, like, you know, open it up, all this kind of stuff, but they were very cautious. And so really they've only... Uh, in the last, I think they started at the end of May, coming back and doing cruises, especially P&O started the May 31st to do cruises. And I'm telling you, people booked for you know, as far ahead as they could and as many as they could because cruising is really, as you know, cruising is a very popular uh, vacation and uh, entertainment destination for a lot of people. So we were like, well, how come? And our friends who had, got, who had left P&O, uh, because you know they have the work as well. We're all working in Europe, in Great Britain, and you know they work. They transfer to the U.S. So we have people doing the, you know, doing the Alaska tours, and we're like, come back. We want you. You know, let's. We want to work. And so we were so happy. It was like homecoming. You know, I just came off of a comedy cruise, and it was just the best. I mean, to have a theater full of people who wanted to be there, and you wanted to be there, and it was just magic. It was just so much fun. That looks yes. like 600 people. That 600 were just people in the market. To laugh. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, you need, as you know, humor is very healing and it was so much fun. People just really wanted to get out and about it and laugh again. And it was just the bomb. It was great. It was wonderful. All right. That, that leads me up to my next question was the 
a Pacific Explorer, you just come back from a comedy cruise. Right. That was a cruise that had multiple comics. Yes. As opposed to one comic for the cruise. Right. Right. How does that work? Well, the comedy cruises, you've got like five comedians generally, or five acts. Um, and they're only three nights, you know, so they're really great. And we do, and there's shows every night. I mean, the other shows still run, you know, the production shows are still there. The music is still there, you know, all of that. They're, they're still there, all the games, everything is still there. But the comedy cruise is like, for, I'll give you an example. Like the first night we do a late night show that um, I host. So I host uh, this particular cruise I was hosting. I host, there's a, there's a headliner with me. We do one, a late night show the next day. Um, the host generally runs a comedy workshop for the for passengers. It's an hour long workshop. We go over what comedy is like, some tips on stuff, because on the last day we have a comedy gong show for the passengers. So passengers get up and they have three minutes to tell jokes, um, or whatever, you know, stories, whatever. And the comics all, jo uh, all give them scores. And then the winner gets uh, prizes from the, from the cruise line. Then that afternoon we do, uh, in the afternoon we'll do a Q&A session with all the comics. If people think comics are crazy, so then what if you're bizarre? What's what's your life like? What have you done? You know, what what have you, you know, who are your favorites? What have your big mistakes or blah blah? So we have an hour long of that. Um, then we have uh, a comedy gala show, which we do two shows on one night. So all of the comics do that one. Um, then. One, one night we do a late night show with a headliner. And then the, the last night we do the comedy gong show, the Q and A, and then we do a late night show with the last comic on. So we do shows every day and every night for the whole thing. And they're all really well attended because a lot of people book specifically because they know it's a comedy cruise. It's three night um, and you get comedy every single day and every night. So it's a great thing. If you like comedy, it's the best. Uh, every cruise that I'm on, whenever I know that there's a comedy show, I'm going to be there. So, yeah, because it's, it's, I love, yeah. I've, I've made a living out of making people laugh all my life without oh, actually yeah, being a comedian, a you know. But you know, here that's the thing people don't, people people have to realize, and I talk about this at the comedy workshop. I say, you know, humor is welcome everywhere. Everyone and everyone is funny. Everyone has the potential to be a comic. It's just that some people do it as a profession, but many people are just hilarious on their own. And when you go to a party, who do you want to sit next to? The one that's complaining about, oh my God, my back hurts. But, or do you want to sit to someone and say, oh my gosh, this is what happened to me at work today. It's hysterical. You know, that's who you want to be with. A storyteller. A storyteller and someone who touches your life. And, you know, most people, they, most people, when you say something funny, they think, oh, my God, that's happened to me. I wish I'd thought to say that. They would have if they thought of it, but they're, ne they're not trained to do that. And that's what the co a professional comic is trained, to find the humor in things and translate it to other people so that they see it clearly and can laugh with you. A good joke teller is always welcome <laughs> anywhere, you know, uh, as opposed to the dad joke where you're like, hey, hurry up. It's 15 minutes. Get to the point. You know, so um, on a regular I love, cruise. I love the gong show. Re revitalizing the gong show that was oh it's it's so, so much, much fun. fun back from the original ones <laughs> you know what's fun about it is that people get to tell their own stories and some people are just so hysterical we've gone up to several people the comics and go what city do you live in here's an open mic you need to get you need to get that go there and and do this you're really good and other people you just say you know just don't try this again <laughs> you know you've done it take it off your list go home you know i mean some people are just miserable but the whole idea is that it's a fun thing and people get to participate and you know that's what it's all about really so i've i've fairly regular especially since things finally got going and down your way again uh, i've had you as, as stories you know australia as stories a number of times on my new show but this week i i had to talk about the couple from uh where were they they were from brisbane that booked uh 57 58 back-to-back -back cruises including two world cruises they're going to be gone on the on the coral princess for 800 days 
So, yeah, that's crazy. I mean, I, you know, I sent him a message to try to get him to adopt me. I, you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, some people. You know, that's the thing. I, when I was in Honolulu, I worked for the visitor industry. And oddly enough, I worked for Abercrombie and Kent, which you probably are familiar with. And we serviced the cruise ships when they came in. And little did I know I'd be working on it someday. But we had people that were literally uh, crystal cruises. There's a woman on crystal cruises who literally lived on board. And she was retired and she was like in her 80s. But you know what? There's a medical office. I know all the food there, you know, you've got people that you've got, you make friends, you know, you see people regularly, the crew knows you, you know, it's a good, it's a good reti retirement venue if you can afford it um, because you've got everything there. And um, there's some people who really spend a lot of time on cruises. I've seen people over and over again, over my, over the last six years. I mean, you know, they, they're there like, Every month, every couple of weeks, they're on a cruise ship. You know, it's great. Well, I've been I've been lucky this year finally because I had medical issues in the pandemic, which delayed me getting restarted again. But um, I've been on nine cruises already this year. Wow! So wow! I've been yeah been lucky and getting ready to go on two more. Yeah, and I have so uh, fun. They're they're a lot of fun. I think I've got eleven booked. So, yeah, but I'm, you know, I'm retired now, so I can, yeah, you know, I can do this without, uh, you know, right. killing myself. Yeah. And, and I'm, yeah. I'm also solo, so I travel, yeah, you know, solo as well, which that, that leads to all kinds of issues with them charging double and all that kind of stuff. But all anyway. right. Right. But it's just terrific. All right. So tell me what's ahead. You've got a win, oh, Winterfest, winter, what's the name of it? Winter Comfest coming yes, up. Yes, a comedy fest coming up in July. Um, I've got a few local uh, club gigs as well, but the comedy fest comes up in July. Um, it's just a two-day comedy festival, and uh, I'm doing one of the days. Um, it's just a comedy show every night, really. It's just a... Uh, a variety of comics from around the country coming to do shows and so that'll be fun because the Adelaide Fringe Festival is just finished and the Adelaide Fringe Festival is the largest um, arts festival in the southern hemisphere um, it's huge I mean and there's tons of comedy there and but and it happens every year so but it happens to between March and um, uh, February and March so during the winter, which is winter here now, um, there is no comedy festival. So this fills the gap quite nicely um, among all the other uh, what uh, among all the other just general, you know, club shows kind of thing and and corporate shows and stuff like that. So yeah, so yeah, so that's I'm looking forward to that. I see some people that I don't normally see that come in from other cities, so that's quite good. Do you have any uh, cruise gigs ahead? Um, what's happening with PO is they've got um, they're rebuilding their fleet. The fleet is coming back, but staggered. So the Explorer is in now. It just came home in May. Um, then there'll be two other ships. One will come in in August and one will come in in October. So then they'll be at full fleet. Um, so they'll be, so they haven't booked all of those yet. However, I have been booked for the uh, December cruise, a comedy cruise between the Christmas and New Year uh, cruises. Um, so like 27, 28, 29, I think I'm doing, or 20, 29, 30, I can't remember. Um, so I'll be doing that one. But in between, we're still waiting for the bookings for the other two ships to come in. So I'm sure I'll be doing something once those get finalized. But yeah, I mean, you know, we all of us that were on this have been on in the June cruises are just dying to, you know, get back, you know, get on. Because at one point before the pandemic, I was literally on a ship three weeks out of four. I'd be come home, I'd wash my clothes, repack, and out the door I'd go. Cause it, it was just booming. There were five ships at the time, so we were all good. Plus, you know, we had Carnival was in um, and uh, Princess and all that. So you had a lot of ships to choose from. So you could go to other ships. A lot of, a lot of the um, acts, as you know, travel from ship to ship and, you know, right. company to company. So, you know, we're doing like the short cruises. And uh, I think the longest cruise I've done was like, 12, 14 days, something like that, where you do all the Pacific Islands, because PNO Australia goes to the South Pacific. So, um, you know, Fiji and uh, Mimea, uh, a lot of the, you know, all the other smaller islands. Um, and uh, yeah, that was fun. So you'd go on 
And as you say, with a, you know, you'd always have a comic on board. So you end up doing a 45 minute show instead of the shorter shows. You do uh, a solo show of 45 minutes uh, at a time. So, you know, you get to, you know, headline your own show in the longer cruises. Right? Just purely out of curiosity, when you're, when you're doing a, a, a cruise gig, are you treated like crew or are you treated like a guest? Well, both actually, uh, depending, um, par- prior to the pandemic, we had, sometimes you had um, guest quarters, guest cabins, and so depending on how the ship is uh, configured. And yeah, and uh, but a lot of times we, what well, we were considered crew. So um, the entertainers were all considered crew. So we worked through the crew office, although we may have uh, cabins uh, in the, with the, with the passengers, but we we had to adhere to the crew rules. Um, but the entertainers were a little a slightly different beast because we had run of the ship. You still had run of the ship because people see you all the time. So they we want to they invite you to have coffee or they invite you to have dinner with them or you know all that. So we could interact with the with the passengers. Um, so we weren't restri- as restricted as the crew, but we still had to comply with the crew requirements. So, but this year so far. Um, we've been considered passengers, so we didn't have to do that. But they're changing a lot of the protocols, and it's still, I think it's still in a, a state of flux. You know, now that everyone's back, they're, they're rearranging things, they're trying to get things organized. So we've been quite lucky because, quite frankly, PO treats us very well. Um, and um, we've made so many good friends among crew and passengers when we came home. It was like homecoming. It was like, Oh my God, you know, you see the same people that are stewards or uh, bartenders or whatever. And it's just, and as you know, being on cruises a lot, they know you, they, they treat you like family. And and that's one of the, the attractions of, of cruising is that it is, you know, you're together uh, a lot and people are very friendly. And if you're on your own, they make an effort to, you know, uh, include you on things. They know you. Um, the crew is great to be with. So either way, we're, we really are, are treated quite well. Well, I got to just thank you so much for being with me. I do have one kind of personal question, though, that I have to ask. <laughs> now, yes. I realize that you are Hawaiian born. Yes. You've been in Australia for a number of years. You've not picked yeah. up the Australian accent at all. <laughs> um, yeah, well, you know, my friends at home think I have a little, but it's mostly the idioms and stuff that you have to get a lot. You know, you have to learn how people say things. You know, I mean, th- some things mean different. Uh, some words are different in Australia than they are in the U.S. And so you have to be careful what you say because people look at you like, what do you, you know, what? Um, like the word fanny, you know, is different in Australia than it is in the United States. So you have to be careful. Once I said that, my husband, and I said, why are they laughing at my husband? Because, well, it doesn't mean what you think it means. You know, so I used to have to, especially in the beginning, I used to have to ask my husband, can I say that? Can I say that? You know, so those kinds of things, you know, and because there's a heavy British influence in Australia, um, a lot of uh, Cockney rhyming slang comes in, you know, like, give me a call on the dog and bone, you know, get, get on the dog and bone, which is a telephone, you know, and, you know, I'm going to have a sticky beak, which is I'm going to have a look at something. I'm going to have, like, you know, you have to, that kind of stuff you you have to, you learn how to, those idioms you learn. But I, I didn't pick up the accent really. And people always go, how long have you lived here, Cal? Why are you still calling it gas and not petrol? You know, I mean, there's some things that just die hard, you know, you just can't get rid of. So I have, I haven't really, you know, but they understand me. It's English. You know, they understand me. Okay. I just have to thank you so much for giving me the time and let me uh, do a little chatting today. My audience is just absolutely going to love this. It's, no and, and by the way, folks, the reason that this isn't live is there's a 13 and a half hour time difference. And there's just no way that, you know, our, when I'm doing the show live, you know, she's going to be in bed sound asleep. So. Yeah, we had yeah, to, that's the thing. To pre-record yeah. this. So. Yeah, so I would well, encourage anyway. people if they're thinking of getting a going on a vacation, going on a holiday, you could do no better than getting on a cruise. I'm telling you, everything's there for you. You have your there's nightclubs, there's restaurants, there's a variety of things for you to do. It's just the best. And you can meet people, and if you're traveling solo, look for Chili. He's traveling solo. You can sit down and have dinner together. You know, Absolutely. just there's a lot of things, a lot of activities. So. 
you can do no better than to spend your money on that. It's the best. And you know that because you've been on a million of them. So you know how good that, that can be. All right. Well, thank you again for being with me. Thank you. We'll, we'll stay in touch and do this again sometime. Sounds like a plan. Thanks for having Thanks. me. Thanks. Aloha. That's K. Hal Jackson of Adelaide, Australia. Lovely, lovely lady. I regularly post videos on all facets of the travel and cruise industry. So if you like to keep up with the latest in cruise ships, ports of call, cruises themselves, chilly chats, and travel and cruise industry news, just hit the little subscribe button in the lower right-hand corner, hit the bell notification so you'll be notified when a new video is up or we go live. This video was produced by Chili's Cruises.